Good morning, everyone from Malaysia. Um, welcome to today's session on the application of the Good Shepherd position paper on the Girl Child to Programs and Projects. Um, as you know, I'm Teresa from the Asia Pacific Mission Development Office. So in today's session, we will link and deepen the application of the Good Shepherd position paper to projects and programs. And we will also have a time of reflection on ourselves and the programs that uh, we are involved in. As with the other sessions that we've had, I would like to go through the principles. The first principle is all of you who are here in this session today, each and every one of you is an expert. It's a subject matter expert on the ground. This session is a guide to mission effectiveness you will be the ones to um, take this session further in your own mission areas and to see how to apply the principles to your programs and projects. We hope during this session to also be able to integrate spirituality and justice and peace with good ministry practices. And as the previous sessions, this entire session will be based on the human rights approach. We looked at this ecosystem previously, and I would like to bring it back again. This is an ecosystem of where the program participant in relation to her family, the community, society at large, country and the international scene. And we see here the fundamental principle that all individual human beings, including the girl child, are rights holders. Those rights are codified in the UN International Covenants and Conventions. Empowerment of rights holders to claim their rights. That's what we're all about. And on the other sphere, we have all rights have corresponding duty bearers, state and state actors, who are responsible in fulfilling the corresponding rights in given context. Accountability of duty bearers to fulfill those rights. And as Good Shepherd, all our projects and our programs are to, are to address the capacity gaps between the rights holders and the duty bearers. So if we look at this screen, the rights holders, including the girl child, our programs should have interventions that would empower them to claim their rights as rights holders. Conversely, our program should also address the accountability of duty bearers to the girl child. I would like to start with this very short video on the girl child taken from UNICEF. So that was a video that spoke about empowerment of the girl child. And I bring you back to the Good Shepherd position paper on paragraph three. When the value of girls is recognized, when their needs are met and their voices amplified, girls contribute to positive change in their families, local communities, nations, and the world. On the 30th of June, we had a webinar uh, by Winifred on the position paper on the girl child. Um, I've shared this video with almost everyone uh, who have signed in on this uh, webinar. 
And in that particular session where Winifred shared with us many, many insights on the position of the girl child, the influences that affect the girl child, the UN documents, the relevant networking parties, the relevant um, information and sources that we can get from different websites. So I encourage you as if you're listening to this session for the first time, to go to that, um, to the YouTube channel and also to watch this webinar on the girl child by Winifred. We heard from Winifred um, and from the position paper that systemic violence begins before birth, at birth and all through the life of the girl child. We also heard on position paper, paragraph two, lines eight and nine, violations occur with impunity, often accepted as cultural, religious, and traditional norms. We look at this ecosystem again, and for us, when we speak about the girl child, the program participant is a girl child. And just as an example, if we speak of the girl child experiencing harmful practices, in, and we hear that these are embedded in religion, tradition, and culture, we also heard that the systems, the social structures, the systemic injustice, and the systemic obstacles that are influencing and are at play um, and these harmful practices on the girl child. And we heard at the webinar how important it is to know the UN conventions and protocols, the Beijing Platform Section L, Convention on the Rights of the Child, the CEDO, the Sustainable Development Goal 5, which speaks of gender equality, Palermo Protocol on Trafficking, how important it is to also know the laws and policies in our own country and to know the local traditions, culture, and religion in addressing systemic violence, structural violence, and systemic obstacles um, affecting the girl child. In the project cycle management and in how we have been moving in the rights-based approach, um, which speaks about identifying core problems, identifying manifestations and uh, root causes, we heard at the webinar with Winifred that it's so important, so very important that we recognize the root causes when we are speaking about systemic violence. And I would like to bring you back to the position paper, paragraph two, which has the whole concept. And I would like to transfer this into this pro uh, pro problem tree analysis. If we read paragraph two, we will find these are the manifestations um, that the girl child is experiencing in terms of uh, violence towards the girl child. Child labor, denial of education, denial of nutrition, infanticide, disregard for birth registration. That means if it's a girl child, uh, the girl child is not registered at birth. Prenatal sex dis uh, dis deselection means that if um, the expectant uh, mother discovers that um, the unborn uh, child is a girl, uh, the, term the pregnancy may be terminated. Sexual abuse, we all know that. Used as objects in prostitution, genital mutilation. We had a whole uh, discourse on the 30th of June on female genital mutilation. Forced and early marriage, sexual harassment, and other forms of violence. Some, vi some forms of violence are very subtle and they may take the form of gender sensitization. Just as an example, in many, um, I'm not sure if it's just prevalent in the Asian culture, um, where the girl child is valued, but is valued uh, to look after the family. And so the expectation of being a girl child is very different from the expectation of being a boy in the family. The girl is expected to do certain things that the boys are not expected to do. So sometimes if these um, kinds of expectation marginalize the girl child from expressing and from um, experiencing fullness of life and from experiencing um, the rights, her rights as a girl child, then it is a form of violence. And so we have at the corner here, harmful practices violence or ritual discrimination that have become culturally normalized. 
And we heard that violence against the girl child is embedded in religion, culture, and tradition. And we also heard about systemic injustice, upheld in social systems, affects the society as a whole, the economy, the judiciary, government, including the church. Subtle attitudes and choices, sometimes unconscious. And we heard about social structures. Girls are disadvantaged over boys. Gender socialization. Dominant systems of patriarchal power. Those are within the social structures. And we also heard about systemic obstacles. Policies, practices, procedures, resulting in unequal access or exclusion, may be unspoken, carried in culture, in government, in family, in religion. So what I've done here is, I've actually mapped from the position paper onto a problem tree analysis. For us to see at the top where the leaves and the branches are, what we see as the effects of issues that affect the girl child. And what we see at the bottom, where we don't see actually, they are the root causes. And those root causes are the structures, the social structures, the systemic injustices, the systemic obstacles that are embedded in religion, culture, and tradition. I would like to pause here for a moment um, and take any questions and answers that you, any questions that you may have, um, just to share that every question or every insight that you have is a valuable insight because it will lead to some other form of discussion and it will help the rest of us um, to think in a different way if it's, you know, and I encourage you to um, share your question or to share your insight. What you can do is you can just um, unmute and I will go back to stop sharing my screen. We can go to unmute, just say your name. I encourage people to put on to speaker view and maybe we could have a question or a reaction to what I've just shared on the transferred the manifestations and the root causes on the problem analysis. Don't worry about uh, or taking down notes. The moment the session finishes, I will email out um, the slides to everyone so that you can have a copy of the slides. Just say your name and then say your question. Benedict from Southwest India. Yeah. These issues are coming from decades of decades. Okay. Now we have to know what are the issues that have been addressed to what level so that we can pick it up from there, improve that issues to complete particular issues that we are facing in. Yes. Yeah, that's my question. Thank you, Benedict, um, for this insight. Um, and we also see um, from what Benedict has just shared that this is a decade old or century old issue. And it is, um, it is disconcerting to know that although it is a very old issue, it is still a very real issue. And we need to ask ourselves, have we made progress over time to address systemic violations against the girl child. Thank you, Benedict. Yes, um, please say your name and, and um, share your view. Uh, I am Kala from Central East India, Nepal province. Yes. Uh, we would like to know, like, these issues are pertaining only in the Asian countries or in European countries also. These are all common with regard to the issues of the girls. Okay. Thank you, Kalai. 
may I ask uh, Winifred, who has a more global view on this issue, uh, to respond, Winifred? Um, good evening to everybody. Um, yes, um, it is a global view, but some of the root causes and some of the manifestations are more prevalent in some countries rather than others. So, for example, uh, when we mentioned about uh, female genital mutilation, um, I noted that this is prevalent in the USA and in Europe and in Australia because of migrants moving and people continuing to practice uh, traditions that they practiced at home uh, in terms of the girl child. Now, um, I also mentioned that while we might have focused globally in terms of FGM being um, uh, an issue uh, in terms of Africa, and uh, now we're finding uh, through the research that it's also happening in different parts of Asia. Uh, equally, the girl child, uh, early ch child early and forced marriage, uh, these are happening uh, in different areas of the world where we least expect it. And then some of the um, gender aspects of being a girl and doing household tasks and um, being socialized as a girl with expectations of what a girl does uh, and how a girl is. Uh, these are prevalent throughout the world um, and are found in all places. So the, the whole idea in, in terms of uh, moving towards gender equality is to challenge uh, these um, uh, traditional practices and realize that girls and boys are capable of doing the same things in any sphere of life. And opportunities should be equally available to boys and girls in all spheres. And if I can just uh, focus on education, uh, very often girls are steered away from uh, mathematics and science and uh, there is a whole emphasis on ensuring that girls take place in uh, take their place in um, subjects to do with STEM uh, which is science, technology, uh, maths. Um, so these are important um, issues in terms of girls. Uh, the whole uh, trust in countries for, uh, for girls and young women and women to engage in political life. You see that struggle happening throughout the world. Uh, so I'll just leave it at that. And it's very interesting. There has been, um, uh, there has been a graphic on Facebook uh, to show that women leaders throughout the world have managed the coronavirus much more uh, efficiently and effectively than have men leaders throughout the world. Um, I have that graphic, I can send it to Teresa and she can send it out to everybody. So it, the gender divide is there. And we can, I believe we can only have gender equality if in actual fact we address these very issues that we're talking about, how the girl child is not treated equally with the boy child and given the very same opportunities. And we've seen the systemic uh, causes and the root causes. Thank you, Winifred. Thank you so much uh, for sharing your insight on this. I think we will proceed with the, um, with the inputs. Okay, so we were here. Hold on to your questions because there will be other opportunities uh, for Q&A. I'd like to share this multi-level framework on influences impacting gender socialization processes during adolescence. Um, and this is taken from UNICEF. And we have here at the individual level where we have the levels of influence and the factors influencing gender socialization. We have biological sex differences physical sexual maturation, cognition and motivation, personality, self-efficacy, and in the gender socialization process, the outcomes, if it's not, if it's uh, biased, we will have gender-based differences in attitudes and beliefs, skills and behaviors. Winifred just shared just now about how sometimes girls are encouraged 
not to go into um, into um, careers and into education that are more uh, related to um, technology. And even in our own programs, we sometimes have programs for our program participants that relate to sewing, that relate to hairdressing, that relate to um, uh, maybe culinary skills, which are all um, gender sensitized roles. Yeah. So at the individual level, we have these factors influencing the girl child and we have these outcomes. If we look at social interactional level, where families and parents come in, social institutions, schools, religious groups, and we also learn that religion and culture uh, play a very, very big role as one of the root causes in affecting the girl child. We have social networks and peers, local media. What does the media do and what, does, what is the messaging that comes across each time uh, with regards to the female gender or the male gender? And then we have neighborhood. And from here, the gender socialization process would be incentives and expectations, gender norms, this is what a girl does. This is what a boy does. This is um, a role that is expected of a, of a girl. And this is a role that's expected of a boy. And we have gender-based practices such as violence and child marriage as an outcome. Next, we look at structural level. Socioeconomic conditions affecting the family, affecting the girl child gender and patriarchal structures. We've heard a lot about this in uh, Winifred's session with us. We also have political structures, political structures that disenfranchise the girl child. We have social structures of race, of class, socioeconomic status, and we also have the global media. And here would be the socialization process of opportunity structures and the division of labor. And the outcome would be gender-based differences in education levels, workforce participation. We would have heard about the glass ceiling um, for women participation in uh, the workforce, social and political participation, fertility regulation. So these three structures, if we look at that, and we look at our ecosystem affecting a program participant and we map it side by side together like this, we will see how interrelated they are and how when we look at the individual level for our programs to our program participants, we cannot neglect the social and interactional level and the structural level because all the whole system takes into consideration the effect on the girl child and it takes into consideration the effects on the program participant. At this point, I would like to concentrate on the individual level because as we shared, we are all part of the system. All of us were children once, whether we were boys because we have some men in the group here with us as participants or we were girls. And I dare say that looking at the number of people who are here with us, more girls than boys when we were children. And sometimes because we have grown up in a situation of, um, of a culture or a religion or a tradition that is handed, is, that is uh, prevalent, we no longer notice the violence that is perpetuated against the girl child. And I'd like to spend some time for us as individuals to look at how we were all shaped when we were raised as children. And change begins with each one of us examining our own cultural, religious, and traditional context. We need to examine our own blind spots. If we don't examine our own blind spots and we come across a violation against a girl child, we are not able to recognize it because we have socialized it within our own system. And so in our programs to girl the girl child, we may say that that 
that violence that is happening is normal in our society and is normal in our context and therefore it is no longer a violation. As an example, as an example, if within our own context, the girl child is always expected um, to, 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 uh, to be the one seeing to the household chores, is expected to be the one um, to cook, is expected to be the one to wash the clothes, is expected to be the one to look after um, the younger brothers and sisters. And so when a girl child comes into our program, and comes into, um, into our program and she's experienced some trauma or she's experienced some violence. She's experiencing some violence. When we do our case management and we look at the presenting problems, if it is a socialization within us as good shepherd people running the projects, and we hear her speak about what she's experiencing, I encourage uh, participants to please uh, mute their mics. Uh, Carla, can you please mute your mic? So, if we have been socialized in this way it, and we have been brought up in this way of functioning and when she shares with us her experiences in her family we may not see it as a violence we may not see it as something that has traumatized her but we may have seen it as something that she should have done this is a very simplistic example that i can think of so i just would like us at this point to examine our experiences growing up as a child. What were my experiences growing up as a child? What were the cultural, traditional, and religious practices that were different for boys and girls in my family, in my community, in society? And at this point, where we are now um, change makers, where we are good shepherd people, and where we are trying to address um, uh, violence against uh, women and girls, you know, we need to ask ourselves, what do I need to let go of? And what do I need to relearn? Where do I need input or help? So at this point, I just want to encourage each one of us, if you have a piece of paper with you, um, you know, to just spend a moment of reflecting, what were your own experiences growing up as a child? Were there any differences um, in how you were socialized? If you were a boy, if you were a girl, in your family, in your community, in society, just to spend a bit of time just reflecting on this. Thank you everyone for um, coming back and I'm sure you had very rich discussions. Um, maybe we can hear the one or two reactions to the questions that were posed. Maybe somebody who has not spoken yet will be good so that we can hear diverse views. In our room, there's no sound. Ah, there's no sound because uh, people... In, in our room, yeah. So we yes. didn't have any sharing. Ah, oh, right. Okay. Maybe after this session, we will collate all the feedback on how to use Zoom. When the session ends, we will have, uh, please stay with us and then we will have a session on how to use Zoom. Yeah. Any reaction to the question that was posed as to what were your experiences growing up as children? Yes, I, Sister Emoshini from Sri Lanka. Yes. I encourage the good speaker view, everyone, so that you can see uh, who Remoshini is. Okay, please go yes. ahead, Remoshini. Yeah. Uh, we had a good session with the Indonesian group. Uh, so we had a discussion uh, under some uh, subtopics uh, like family, education, and uh, society. And we also had a discussion on uh, job opportunities. Mm. In both the countries, sometimes in the families, we had this discrimination 
and uh, we had uh, some problem uh, we see a lot of difference in boys growing up and girls uh, bringing up and uh, in uh, in our mission field sometimes we feel in uh, some uh, places we have uh, some uneducated people where we have tea pluckers uh, so we feel the girls uh, education are restricted mm. and some given opportunities to continue their higher education and even in the society when the job is the job opportunities are created sometimes the girls are not given the full priority sometimes uh, the jobs uh, they dis- uh, they have some rules for the boys and girls sometimes the higher salary jobs are given to boys so we feel that, that both the countries we had like similar experiences thank, thank you very you. much thank you thank you i want to uh, thank ramoshini and the um, fellow participants in her breakout room for this uh, sharing i want to go back to the original question which was what were your experiences growing up as a child did you experience um any discrimination or was were you treated differently because you were a boy or because you were a girl maybe one or two more reactions because it's very important for us to identify our own blind spots when we are working, um in in this sector yes yes yeah. please listen to pushpa benedict yes uh, give someone else the opportunity to also yeah. uh, share. As I was reflecting, like there was a difference, like uh, doing household activities. Uh, my brothers were uh, not washing their plates. I would wash their plates. As a young girl of sixth standard, seventh grade, we had wash all the brothers' clothes and so the discrimination was there. Even girls, like uh, when we go out and all before dark, we should come back. And we were not really able to relate with boys. So till 10th grade, we, I was studying in the only for girls school. When I went for junior college, I found it very, very difficult to relate with the boys because we were kept very secure. I used to be very frightened or shy to talk to them. These are the differences that uh, in the childhood, the difference as an adult, uh, adolescent girls, the difference was made. Yeah, that's a traditional or cultural practices. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Pushpa. Thank you. And from what we heard from Pushpa, um, the way we were raised as a girl, as, as um, in, within the context of religion and culture and traditions, actually affects the person in their adolescent years and in their young adulthood. And, you know, and it also frames and shapes the choices that we make in life. And it frames and shapes the kind of work that we do, the kind of education and the kind of people that we relate to. Can we have one or two more reactions to this? Maybe someone no. from a different culture and a different country? Yes. And Benedict? Uh, yes, Benedict. Yeah. See, as we are a child, my mother used to give all the course that girl has to do it at home. So we did all the work. There's no differentiate between girls and boys. Mm. So as we grew, we know our responsibilities. We do our work our own. We don't never depend upon girls or wife or whatever it is. We treat them same way in our children. Mm. So wherever we work in the community, we have to educate the women that they should give the boys also same responsibility as we give the girls. Mm. As they grow up, they, the violence or discrimination reduces. That's the basic problem. Mm-hmm. Thank you, Benedict. Um, it's very nice to hear a refreshing change uh, that you know you were raised in a family where there was no discrimination between a boy and a girl. Um, and I would like also to um, take on from what you just shared about the importance of educating the women to give the same kind of chores to boys and girls. I would like to reframe that narrative and say that we should actually educate the men as well and the boys in how they look at girls and how they look at women not just the women to train uh the the sons in the family but the fathers must be also um and the men within the community how do we have our programs that address both men and women yeah someone else maybe from a yes i'm francis from Myanmar. Hello, Francis. Hi. Uh, yes, and I like to share my opportunity, uh, opinions in my family. Is that 
Uh, we have uh, five siblings, and uh, uh, my parents put together just as a, a education or some place. Uh, <clears throat> my parents uh, put me uh, put us together to the, to go to schools, and we help together and we. Uh, but um, just just, just uh, as a girls. They, they, they know what they have to do, like they have to behave or they have to act, like this they know. And also, <clears throat> as a boy, as a boy, we have to do our duty. And sometimes, sometimes uh, the girl, my mother or my sister is not, uh, is not free and we have to do their work. So we, 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 we help them. Mm -hmm. that is the that is uh, what, what's happened in my family. Mm. Thank you for sharing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It's so important um, the way uh, boys are also raised to, you know, share in the household. Thank you so much. Thank you. Any other reactions from anyone? Yes, Gendry. Teresa, <coughs> um, I just thought it was interesting. Um, Melania and I were in a group together. Melania from South Korea. Um, yes. And we actually both had the very same experience of a story um, that when we were young girls, um, we both actually had this idea that we would love to become altar boys. And um, we both apply or, you know, looked into it, but we're knocked back because we were girls. So that's our experience of, I guess, in the church, the cultural um, kind of expectations there. But I thought it was interesting um, that, you know, that's Australia, South Korea. So there is an example of something that's um, not just sort of a local country culture, but something that was pervasive across cultures as well. Mm, thank you for sharing. Thank you, thank you, Gendry. And um, one aspect of the root cause was also religion and how gender socialization happens within a religious context. Thank you so much. Anyone else? One last reaction and then we will move on. This is a very interesting topic. Hello? It brings us back to yeah. our, yes. Who, uh, who is speaking? Yes, Goretti. Uh, I just want to share a little bit that, yes, it is in my family. Uh, my father used to, to see the men, uh, the girl or the boys is like same. It is what we recognize it when we are mature enough. We talk that we feel that our fathers only, our father only love us most, but the other also feel the same. But I'm thinking about uh, the media that it is uh, influenced a lot for the girl child or oh, child. Oh, yeah. Uh, sometimes I feel like uh, the media give a lot of influence for the girl to grow like what the common want to see as a girl. Is uh, so sometimes even the principle when we know about the. Uh, uh, how uh, I need to be as a girl, sometimes it is uh, cannot be really strong enough because all around, like the friends, bring us to the what the media asks the girl to be. Mm. Thank you, Goretti. Mm -hmm. Thank you for sharing. Thank you. Thank you. The media plays a very important role in shaping and framing the narrative. Yeah. One last reaction and then we'll move on. Can I yes, say something? Sure, but you go ahead. Yeah. Um, I was just reflecting that um, well, well, when I was growing up, I did experience some uh, kind of like, in that sense, uh, discrimination between my brothers and me. But I was just reflecting that um, actually it's women who perpetuate this sometimes. Yeah, because it was from my mother and not from my father that the uh, actions came from. For example, the best part of the chicken was kept for my brother and we all got the wings, you know. Uh, but it was my mother who made the decision, not my father. Mm. Yeah? Uh, so sometimes I think for, for, uh, for us ourselves, you know, um, very, you know, whether it's a conscious or an unconscious uh, kind of action that we ourselves, you know, perpetuate. Uh, this whole um, treatment, you know, this inequality, uh, the treatment of in inequality uh, among boys and among girls, you know. Mm. So uh, I think that came up, like just struck me, like 
actually it's my mother more than my father who you know um, who kind of acted you know uh, in a way that um, benefited or that supported more boys more more my brothers than than the girls mm. yeah yes thank you Chu. thank you so much um i just want to react to what po Chu shared about um her mother you know um and the experience her experiences with her mother i will go back to how was her mother socialized see because it is generation to generation and as uh, benedict shared in the first opening that this is an issue that has been around for ages and it's a socialization issue and it does it cuts across the socioeconomic statuses it doesn't matter whether we are in a first world country or a developing country it's a socialization and it goes back to the root causes of culture and tradition as well and as Jenry shared just now how religion also plays a role that minimizes the, the female gender yeah so i shall move on in the um input and i want to thank you all for sharing i'm sure there's so much more uh rich sharing you know in the different groups but we just don't have time to go into that um i want to leave you with one question for reflection like a homework, if you like to put it that way. To what extent do I, through my attitudes, behaviors or unreflected actions, promote, perpetuate unjust systems and structures that demean, that demean the girl child, not recognize her inherent dignity or infringe her human rights? This was a question posed by Winifred in the last uh, session. And as I was looking through the slides, I thought that, you know, we didn't have time previously to actually um, reflect more on this. So as we just reflected on our own uh, upbringing as children, as a girl or as a boy, and how that gender sensitization has happened through time, maybe we are not aware of certain actions that we do. And it's time to just take, to pause and um, to just reflect on this. Am I conscious of some of my own behavior patterns um, that actually demean the girl child and not recognize her inherent dignity or even infringe her human rights? And as I realize this, what do I need to let go of and what do I need to relearn? It's not easy, yeah? And where do I need input or help? And even as we are speaking, I would encourage each one of us and each of our programs and ministries to actually gather all our mission partners and all our staff together and have a session on how do we view the girl child and what were our own experiences um, and how are we today when we reflect on the Convention on the Rights of the Child, the rights of the child to be heard, the right of the child to have an opinion, um, the right of girls to have the same equal access as boys. How do we shape our programs so that boys and girls have the same uh, access to and the same opportunity to education and to jobs? How do we socialize the girls who are in our system? Yeah, so just encourage you to um, have this reflection. Okay, we are back here. And the next question that we must ask ourselves, moving from ourselves as change makers to our programs, and to ask do our programs address root causes? Root causes that we don't see, systemic injustice, social structures, systemic obstacles. Do we look at and examine religion, culture, and tradition and say at which points do this narrative child? Many of our places have got programs on residential care where we bring the girl child in from a very young age, especially if she has no other options and choices, and she lives in residential care. And the program actually shapes how she will be and how she will be as an adult, because the formative years are the years uh, where she's a child and she actually lives with us. So do our programs 
um, address gender violence? And do our programs look at our own cultures, our own traditions and our own faith systems and say, how do we shape our interventions where the rights of this girl child is addressed and where her dignity as a girl child, as an equal to a boy child is upheld and where she is socialized as one that has, um, that has equal rights. And how do we shape her learning? And how do we shape her character? We also have outreach programs where we do programs in the community, where we go out and we um, do programs in schools, where we have an influence to girls and boys um, within society. We also have education, formal and informal. Some of us run schools. Some of us have learning centers. Within this education setting that we have, how do we encourage um, gender sensitization that takes into consideration both the dignity of the girl and the dignity of the boy? How do we encourage equal participation? How do we have subjects that you know, even boys, girls can actually sign up for? We have community-based programs and sometimes these programs addresses both the manifestations and as well as the root causes where we go into communities and we speak to communities about the rights of the girl, the rights of women, where we talk about the CRC, where we have um, awareness programs on CEDO, where we run programs on the 16 days of no violence to women and girls. We also do advocacy that addresses both uh, systemic root causes as well as the manifestations. And my question to each one of us is, how deep do we go in addressing root causes? How are we shifting our programs where we are more comfortable addressing what we see than addressing what we don't see that are within the systems and structures within our culture, tradition, and religion? Okay, so we will pause here for any questions that may arise. Yeah. There is not, there is a yeah. question. Yes, yes, Mary Jean. Chatting board, there is a question. I can't go to the chat board unless I stop sharing, which I will do now. Okay, we have here a question from, is this the one you're referring to? From Dell. when a gender-based abuse stems from a religious or cultural background, how do we address it without being accused or being discriminatory? Uh, that's a very good question and um, one example from this question would be female genital mutilation, okay, that uh, stems from a cultural and a religious uh, background, uh, mainly within the Muslim faith. Um, and how do we address this uh, without being accused of being discriminatory and how do we respect um, the faith system of another culture, another group? Um, we have been struggling with this uh, for some time and I think the, I would like to just attempt to respond to this, uh, that we must be able to recognize discrimination and violence as it is. And for us to address something that's deep rooted within tradition, culture and religion, we must start with the basis of research. And we must put ourselves in the shoes of the other and see from that perspective and to learn about the religious practices and where it is coming from. And we must read up on other narratives, research that's been done by other NGOs, by universities, uh, by faith groups. And then we take a position based on what Good Shepherd position is. And in the position of, for example, female genital mutilation, there are four different types of FGM. And uh, within societies like Malaysia, Singapore, Indonesia, it is very much religious based. So how do we address this issue um, without, you know, and is this a very deep seated issue that is based in religion? 
my my take would be um, how do we network with other NGOs that are working on this issue and how do we look at the systemic injustice within policies within the country and the legislative um, practices within the country and if we can work around enacting a law that prohibits FGM then we can start to address the religious practice because it has become a law within the country but in many countries like Malaysia, Singapore, Indonesia and many other places it is not a law in the country that um, prohibits FGM so I'm not sure how you can address it but I think the starting point is to immerse ourselves in the problem and to understand the issue and to understand where the acupuncture points are and then to work from there. Any One other reactions? One in safe. Benedict? Yes, Benedict. Yeah. yeah. See, the tradition, once tradition and religion can change, but the culture is very difficult to change unless the environment changes. So the challenge for the Good Shepherd, Benedict, is yeah. to be able to address this within the culture. And for some of us, it is very difficult to address it because we ourselves are not comfortable with our own gender and we have blind spots uh, to the violations that happen to, you know, to, to ourselves as well because it has been sensitized within the, the social system. Yeah. So can we um, have one more question from someone else? If it's possible, do you, do you have any questions, anyone? Before I share screen again. Okay, I'm back here. The next thing that we need to look at is, we sometimes carry on an existing program through the years. When was the last time we reviewed our program for the girl child? Are our programs based on the principles of the Convention on the Rights of the Child? Do our interventions address the trauma that the girl child has experienced in the ecosystem surrounding her? Family, community and society at large. Do our interventions address the trauma that the girl child has experienced in the ecosystem surrounding her? Family, community, society at large. Welcome back. I encourage you to also scroll in the chat box. You will see um, many people sharing the experiences in the chat box. Are we all back? Yes, it looks like we're all back. Yes. Um, can we hear from one or two groups on your reactions as to how your programs are? Just say your name and then, um, you know, share with us what you have spoken in your small groups. Uh, I'm Sister Gausala. Yes, yes Gausala. Sister. Yes. The, the intervention which you do in the community level, like in plantation sector, uh, we feel we create more awareness uh, regarding their own culture, the rights of the children. So we see the attitude change in the parents, even the girl child. The girl child, especially the girls are more motivated than the boys. Mm -hmm. Each one has their own the set goal that they wanted to come up and so interested in the, that their confident level has increased that they themselves can come up in, in life. Mm -hmm. So, Thank and you. as a society as a whole, uh, it's accepted because mm. at the present uh, time, the girls have to study and come up and have a different uh, lifestyle, like mm -hmm. cope, cope with other other society or the, the national level. So it's like I feel the intervention which we are moving systematically and methodically 
it helps the community to uh, to see rather we see the shift the attitude change and the change okay so 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 gausala thank you for sharing yeah. thank you for sharing and um this particular program is in the tea estate yeah. and from what gausala shared just now it addresses both the manifestation and it also attempts to address the root causes within the um, social, economic, and political system within the T estates. So what she has just shared is that whilst, uh, as they address the issue of um, creating safe spaces for children, they also um, speak to the parents and they also work with the community uh, within the estates and they are seeing changes. Yeah, so when we look at the problem tree analysis, we all understand that to make a change, we need to address the root cause. When you address the root cause, the manifestations change. But if we only address the manifestation and not the root cause, we will be doing the same program year after year, and we are only affecting very, very small numbers. But if we address the root causes, we can exit from the place where we are working because we would have set up a system um, that is different, uh, that is more empowering uh, for the girl child. And for children as a whole. Yeah. Someone else, uh, thank you, Gausala. Someone else? This is a practice session, yeah, for you to say, I have something to share. Shall I share something? Yes, Peter, go ahead. Yeah, we, have, we have the economic justice project which is going on in tribal and Dalit uh, communities where we have been successful in uh, promoting men's support group for women's initiative in economics. Now, the, the very uh, first step that they are agreeing to join what women are doing is a change that we have brought in. Hmm. And the, the feeling that women had that, you know, our work is different and men's work is different, we are separate and they are. So this very feeling is slowly, slowly being diluted through our program where we are extremely happy and I'm happy to share that. Mm. Thank you, Peter. Thank you. So it looks like this program that you're running is addressing the social structures. You're addressing uh, the social structures yes. that perpetuate the discrimination of uh, women and men, you know, and um, have uh, put them yeah. into gender sensitized roles. So thank you for sharing that it is yes. possible to affect a social structure, which is very cultural and traditional. Thank you for sharing. Yes, yes, Salome, go ahead. Okay, I, in my group, we were talking, as we looked at the programs that's been currently carried out, we also said that, uh, yeah, we need to kind of uh, insert this into our, you know, uh, programs to review, if not, we'll be carrying out the same. And interestingly, because we were a religious group, we also said that we have to look at our formation program because our formation program sometimes is so protective. Even, you know, uh, temporary professors just are not allowed to go here, there, you know. So, you know, in a way, it's also within our own system of religious life and religious communities, which we need to really look and, and see why, you know, a big question there. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Salome. It's so brave to raise this at this platform. Uh, I thank you for raising this because that was the reason why I also started uh, with, you know, looking at ourselves and looking at how we have been sensitized in our different roles. Um, and thank you for raising the fact that we need to relook at formation because if we have been formed that way and we are running programs for girls, surely how we were formed will flow into how we shape our interventions and how we do, we protect the girl child within our residential programs, you know, and, um, and uh, socialize them to uh, mature in a certain parameter that we are familiar with that may not be necessarily uh, based on the rights of the child to a whole spectrum of opportunity that's available. And how do we in our own programs have gender sensitized outcomes, you know, and it's so prevalent in Good Shepherd programs because it's a faith based organization and it's a women faith based organization. 
So the first step in examining our programs and the changes that we want to do to girls is to examine ourselves and to examine how we have been sensitized into our roles. And it's not easy. It's not easy. Thank you for sharing. One more reaction and then we need to move on because uh, we're running out of time. I'm Teresa. Yes, Katrina. Uh, we were in our discussion, we are looking for our education system. Yes. Because education system, uh, in education, girls is, how do we promote the girls' right? Something. Then uh, it's very uh, basic education to really uh, journey with the girls. Because then we see also uh, like how we handle the girls those who are experiencing trauma. Uh, questioning also like our resources, our network, our capacity, because how to empower the girls. So then, then this is really is like uh, bringing us to re, uh, to see our realities and how we have to move together and uh, really promoting the girls, right? Empower them to become uh, really uh, agents of things is from the beginning. Thank you, Katrina. Thank you. And as I listen to Katrina, what comes to mind is how are we having capacity development sessions for all of us? Because we can only change the program if we change in our mindsets. And I encourage each one of us here to go back to all our individual sites and to look at what kind of training do we give ourselves and the people who work within the programs. Thank you for that. I will now go back to the last part of our discussion for today. Um, and I encourage you to just be patient for a little while more. Um, I will give you the slides later. We are now looking at, in the last session, we said we will try to have a regional event on the International Day of the Girl Child, which is 11th of October, 2020. Um, there are different ways of doing this. We could start on the 11th and we could actually end on December 10 if we want to do a significant project as one region. Uh, it could carry on to the 16 days of no violence against women and girls and we can end with Human Rights Day on December 10. I leave it to you um, as we discuss. So just to share this very um, short video. What was once just a spark is now a flame, a force sweeping the globe. We're the innovators, the artists, the mentors, the scientists. We're standing up and speaking out. In the schools, in the streets, and online. Girls in tech are cracking the code. We're shattering the ceiling, creating the innovative solutions of tomorrow to connect, to organize, to be heard, to be the change. With the Girls Empowerment Initiative, we're boosting our digital skills to reach our full potential. We're designing apps to break taboos. We're harnessing AI to end violence. And we're bridging the digital divide. We're lifting each other up and making each other stronger, empowering ourselves and engaging others. There's 600 million adolescent girls in the world. Imagine what we can do with the right technology. These are our tools. This is our time. Join us. Just wanted to show that video which uh, is very progressive and um, maybe it will help us to shape our thinking with regards to the girl child. So the announcement uh, for this year's uh, celebration, the theme is My Voice, 
our equal future. The International Day of the Girl, 11th October, is a key activation moment for all of us to raise up the diverse range of adolescent girls' voices and action for an equal future. Under the theme, My Voice, Our Equal Future, International Day of the Girl Child 2020 will focus on reimagining a world shaped by adolescent girls' voice, vision, and solutions to live free from gender-based violence, harmful practices, HIV AIDS, learn new skills toward the future they choose, they chose, lead as a generation of activists, accelerating social change. So this is the theme for this year, yeah, um, the United Nations theme. Um, and there are three focus areas, three focus areas. I will go on to the next screen. How can we get involved in this? Share stories of inspiring adolescent girls, groups of girls, girl-led organizations who are developing innovative solutions, or leading efforts toward positive social change, including gender equality in their communities and nations. Let's collectively amplify their leadership, actions, and impact to inspire others. Participate in a youth-led digital activation. Youth are developing a digital activism campaign on TikTok, aiming to raise the diversity of girls' voices and vision of a reimagined future. Stay tuned for information in September of how to get involved in the challenge and spread the activation, activation among your networks. Use IDG 2020 Communications Toolkit to be shared in September to advocate shared key messages, raise awareness and demand actions from stakeholders and decision makers. So if we look at this, these are ways to get involved. These are the issues, this tree, okay? These are ways to get involved. So we need to ask ourselves, what are one or two key issues that we can highlight in the Asia Pacific region with regards to the girl child, yeah? What are one or two key issues that we can highlight in the Asia Pacific region uh, with regards to the girl child? 